Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. Let's do something that we don't normally do. Go ahead and stand up for me. Would you stand up? We haven't done this in a while, and I want to do it. And they gave me a microphone, so I get to. Go ahead and shake the hand of someone next to you. Introduce yourself. Say hi. And don't just shake hands with your spouse, okay? McGinnis's, I see you. Yeah, I see you. Shake hands with someone else. Oh, see, that's beautiful. Love to hear the church alive. Once you get back to your seats, continue to stand. Stay standing if you're able to. Go ahead and get your Bibles out. If you don't have it, it'll be on the screen. Now, once we finish reading the verses, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord, and you will say Thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, you're getting better. We'll see. We'll see. We're going to be in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, starting at verse 24. Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Through the rain comes, though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise, the winds beat against the house. It won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But if anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teacher's of the religious law. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we just invite you into this space now. We ask that your spirit would be upon us, that we would hear your word today, that as we gather together as a community, we would put you first and allow your spirit to work in us. Lord, I pray that anything I would mess up or mispronounce, that you would clean it up in the ears of those who are listening. Thankful for every single person that is here every single person that is watching online as well, that they chose to listen to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I was trying to think of a a good opening story because I feel like Pastor Chuck always has like these great like comedic moments in the middle, like the beginning. I'm like, all right, I got to top him. I can't, I can't let him be. I'm really competitive by nature, so... I'm like, I got to think of something really good. And so we're talking about, if you didn't know from the opening uh, verses there, that we're talking about a foundation. So I thought, what's a good foundation? I was like, well, I could talk about being barefoot. That's a good foundation. You know, walk around. I mean, if you notice today, I wore shoes. Okay. All right. All right. I wore shoes today. Next Sunday, I'm not wearing shoes. You can promise you that. But I was like, no, I'm not going to talk about that. And then I got this idea of talking about Lego. Someone told me first service, even if it's plural, you say Lego, not Legos. Did anyone else know that? You guys knew this? Mike didn't. He didn't know that. It's Lego. I was like, did you listen to any of the sermon? He's like, no, I just, that's all I heard the whole time was Legos. So I'm going to talk about Lego. And then, you know, I'm going to say Legos. I like it better. It flows better, right? I'm going to talk about Legos. So for Christmas, we got one of my sons a Lego, and it was a tractor, all right? Like, we built this tractor. Now, I don't want to sound like the old man who says, like, get off my lawn, but I am for a second. Listen, when we were growing up, we didn't have these fancy Legos that looked like spaceships and cruise ships and tractors and whatever. We had a bucket of Legos, and you had to make something. Your plane was square. Your house was square. That was good. 
Your spaceship was square. Like, everything was square. There's no way around it. Now they have, like, these pieces that are, like, rounded. And, I mean, you can make, like, a star. You can make anything from any movie that you want to. All right, I'm going to get off. off. I got to stop. Okay. I'm a, I'm a little salty about that, if you don't know. We just had the normal Legos. Anyways, so we're building this Lego. And it's a, uh, it's a farm equipment machine. We're raising stuff. We're cutting down the crops. We're doing all this stuff that you do with Legos. But here's the thing. When, when you have the Legos and it's fully complete and it looks beautiful, right? Then what happens over time? They begin to lose its pieces, right? Over time, you begin to lose these pieces. And if you're a parent with kids, you know how you find those loose pieces is you step on them with your bare feet. But if you've trained your feet to be barefoot, it doesn't hurt. Just, just saying. I'm just going to throw that out there real quick. I'm going to leave it there. Or you're vacuuming and you're... And I, whenever I do that, I yell out to the kids like, you're not getting that one back. That one's gone. But over time, we just begin to lose these pieces. They don't look any different for the most part. It's still a Lego and still can function, but over time we begin to lose these pieces. And so what we're talking about today is this solid foundation we're trying to build. That over time we begin to lose some of the pieces in our life because of the chaos that comes to us. So in our in our verse that we started with, our anchor text, we're at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus had this big grand teaching. One of his one of his grandest teachings that he had. And at the very end, he talks about this solid foundation that we need to build. But at the very beginning, before the sermon starts, he gives the whole reason that he's here on earth. Matthew 4, verse 17. From then on, this is when he comes out of the desert with the devil. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, without trying to sound too crude and making the Sermon on the Mount into one sentence, I'm going to, okay? Father, forgive me. But basically, what Jesus is talking about, this is the whole reason I am here, is so that you and me, we can turn and repent of our sins. But how do we do it? Sermon on the Mount. What does a follower of Jesus look like? Sermon on the Mount. So we're not going to get too deep in the Sermon on the Mount. All right, we could be here for a long time. But basically, Jesus is saying, you need to turn from the way that you are going, and you need to follow me. That's what he was talking about. So our first point, awareness precedes repentance. One's knowledge of sin is dependent on their knowledge of God. It's very hard to turn from something if you don't know what you're doing is wrong. Because culture will tell us that we're not doing anything wrong. The world will tell us, you're a good person. You're all right. You didn't kill anybody. You're all right. Check the Sermon on the Mount. You didn't sleep with someone's wife. You're all right. Check the Sermon on the Mount. Culture will tell us many, many things, but the Word of God will tell us something very different. And if we want to be a follower of Christ, if we want to repent and turn and follow Jesus, someone has to tell us. What's one of the first things little kids do? They don't come out and say, Here, take. It's yours. What do they do? Mine. We are selfish creatures. And unless someone is willing to tell us about the gospel, about the good news, about Jesus, there's no way that we could ever turn. And that's what this whole series, the mission is about, is that we are able to go and tell others about Jesus. But it starts with us. And it starts with sowing in, in ourselves so that we know Jesus. Because it's hard to tell someone else about Jesus if you don't know about Jesus. If you take an empty cup, well, it's hard to fill something with an empty cup. 
And that's what investing in yourself looks like. Investing in the one who loves you. I'm going to tell you a little story here. When I was first getting into ministry, even before I was hired on, on at a church, I was volunteering in the kids' area, little kids' area, four or five-year-olds. And there was, this, there was this cute girl there, okay? That's not the reason that I signed up. I wanted to serve the kids. My wife's not here at the service, but she was earlier. She was the one in charge. And I remember I came in, she was like, she wanted me to tell the story to the four and five year olds, okay. And I was so nervous. <laughs> like four and five year olds, I was super nervous. I had, I, I promise you, I had more notes for four and five year olds my first time than I do here today. Like three pages more, okay. I wrote everything out. I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say this, oh, that's good, that's good. I don't even know what that means, but I'm gonna say it. I was still learning, okay? And so I get in there and I was like, I was like, hey Heidi, look at this. Look at all that. I was like, I'm gonna tell a good story today. I'm a little nervous, but I'm gonna tell a good story. She looked at it and she's like, no, no. She said, you can't do any of that. I was like, what? I prepared all week for this. She said, they're four and five. Say this, say this, say this, do something funny, and let's get out of there. Okay. I needed someone to show me, someone to disciple me because I was still learning. I was still trying to understand. And she poured into me. And I, told her, and I told her this morning, I said, look at us now. I'm up here, no notes, just preaching away. You would have never known. But that's what discipleship looks like. It's this progression, this movement forward. And I wouldn't have been able to make that movement forward if somebody wasn't investing in me here. But the thing is, someone invested in her before, right? Yeah. She didn't just show up one day and be like, hey, I love God. Her parents poured into her. And now we're pouring into our kids. This is how discipleship works. So for Jesus, this whole discipleship thing and following him, it's all about a choice. There's always a choice. The Calvinists wouldn't believe this. They're, they're a little upset right now. But there's always... That was a pastor joke. I'm sorry. Oh, Pastor Chuck's not in here. Jerry got it. Pastor Jerry got it. Calvinists don't believe in free choice. Uh, all right, don't do pastor jokes. Got it. But there's always this choice, right? Like, we have this choice. We can choose the solid foundation. We can choose Jesus. Or we can choose the sand, the death, the destruction, the chaos. Jesus gives us this choice. And he gives it all throughout the, the book of Matthew. What are you going to choose? You're going to choose me? You're going to choose death? Let's look at a few times he said it. Matthew 17, or Matthew 7, Matthew 7, verse 12 through 14. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. The choice. The choice. Look a little further in Matthew, Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. So Jesus is giving us this, this moment of choice. Are we going to choose the foundation, the solid foundation? And I think when he's presenting this moment, he's thinking about the book of Proverbs, because in the book of Proverbs, it talks all throughout about making the choice. You can choose wisdom or you can choose folly. Which one are you going to choose? Proverbs 9, verse 1, wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. Picking up in verse 10, fear of the Lord is the foundation 
of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Moving ahead. Verse 17. Stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret tastes the best. But little do they know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of the grave. So I think very clearly that Jesus, in this moment, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when he's saying, repent, turn, follow me, what are you going to build it on, wisdom or folly? What are you going to choose? Because our foundation is important. And the foundation that we have is very key when those moments in life hit. And you know those moments I'm talking about. It's not when it's sunny degrees, sunny outside and 90 degrees, and you got the windows open with your hand like this. You like that. It's when the chaos happens. Oftentimes, our foundation is revealed when the chaos happens. When things start to go awry, what do we build on? Wisdom? Jesus? Life? Death? Destruction? And really, the, the foundation of what we're talking about, the, of discipleship and, and wholeness, is shalom. True discipleship, true guidance, comes from a foundation of one's holistic holiness. Now, when we think of peace, the word shalom in the Bible, we think of laying down arms, and it can mean that, or we think of the absence of conflict. That would be our modern understanding of what peace is. But when the authors are using the word shalom, and what they're talking about in peace is this wholeness, whole body, this holistic holiness, mind, body, and spirit together following God. That's what true peace is. True peace is when everything about me is following him. Because the thing is, we're, not, we're more than just our mind. We're embodied people. I mean, we have arms. We have legs. We're alive. Jesus was embodied, right? So it has to be important if Jesus did it. The way that we live this life is important. John 14, 27 says this. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Rather, it is the assurance of Jesus amid the chaos. Let's say that again. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Rather, it is the assurance of Jesus amid the chaos. Jesus wants to be in our chaos. He lives for it. And I have to give a little credit here. Pastor Jerry, him and I came up with that line. Okay, so I just wanted to... We were having a conversation. That's what came out of our conversation. I wanted to cite my source there. I can't do that stuff. That's very... But Jesus wants to be in our chaos. There's this foundational moment with Jesus and the disciples. They're on this boat. They're going across the water. Everything's perfect. Jesus falls asleep, sees nice and calm, beautiful scene. Then the rains come. The wind comes. The thunderstorms come. Chaos comes. And chaos is at their doorstep. And what do they do? They run around. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? What's Jesus doing? Why is he sleeping? Why, help us, Jesus. What are you doing? Wake up, Jesus. And he's just sitting there napping. Just sleeping a good one. Mark 4, verse 39. This was Jesus' response. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind... And he said to the waves, silence, be still. 
Suddenly, the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Jesus controls the chaos. Jesus controls death. He defeated it. On the cross, he defeated it. The chaos has no power in our lives. If, if we're willing to trust him. Because in those moments of chaos, those are the hardest moments to trust. The hardest. Because when the chaos is around you, when the darkness is around you, you want to do what's easy. Because the right thing isn't always the easy thing. Some of you have heard me speak before. Some of you haven't. But I was living in the darkness for a long time. I'm coming up on 13 years of sobriety. And I lived in the darkness. I had to make the choice, often the wrong choice. Do I continue with my addictions or do I pay my electric bill? What's easy? What's easy to keep doing what I'm doing? I'll think about that tomorrow. Culture will tell you it's fine, it's okay. You're not hurting anyone. What are you going to choose? Wisdom? Jesus? Life? Or are you going to continue through death and destruction? Now, for me, it was drugs and alcohol. For other people, it might be sex. It might be food. There are many things that keep us from the light. Some of us try to escape, right? Oh, this is too difficult. This is too hard. I'm just going to pull back and go play my video games. Oh, I don't really want to deal with this right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my kids to every sporting event that I can. I'm having marital issues, but if I just invest in my kids, it'll be all right. What happens when the kids graduate? You look around, you're like, I I don't even know this person. We all have these things in life that we put before God. But any builder will tell you that the things that you build with are very important. We talked about the foundation, how that's the bedrock. Jesus is the foundation. But the decisions that we make daily are the building materials of our life. And we can either make good choices or bad choices. This is what I tell my kids all the time. I said, there are consequences for every decision you make. They can be good. They can be bad. They can go either way. And sometimes, sometimes we don't even get to choose the chaos that happens in our life. Because we live in a broken world, the chaos just comes at us. You didn't choose for your spouse to leave you, but they left. You didn't choose for your son or daughter to die early, but they did. You didn't make that choice. But I bet you in those moments when the chaos hits, your foundation will be revealed. Is it wisdom? Is it folly? So part of, part of this message and where I came up with this peaceful pieces was the title of the message. I, I was speaking to the hymn sing a couple months ago and I was speaking from Romans 5 verses 1 through 5. And we spent some time reading through it and talking. And basically what I told them was, I don't know. This is what God's laid on my heart. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I don't know what it means. I don't even know why I'm standing up here. I don't know why Jerry invited me to talk to you. I have no idea. This is what God gave me. And I read it to him and we talked about it. And at the end, I was like, there you go. That's it. That was it. 
But I think what God was working and what he was doing was getting us, this community, to this point. Because I think what he's saying in here fits perfect in our topic today. So let's read Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace. Peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserving privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. And so what Paul is speaking to here, and what I think he's trying to show us, is this circle of peace. And how it just continues to work in this circle. That our faith will lead to peace with God. Our peace with God leads to hope through grace. Hope leads to sin because of the brokenness of this world through trials. Trials lead to character through perseverance. Character leads to holiness through the Holy Spirit. And then it just keeps working around. When we choose God, we choose to trust him. Our faith in him will bring us peace. That's what Paul's telling us right here. But there are going to be moments and times when the chaos hits us. Are we going to stay on the circle? Or are we going to jump off and go back with what's easy, what's normal, what the cultural say is fine? Are we willing to do the hard stuff? Now, I know some of you are here and saying, I'm tired of trials. When's the peace coming? I don't know. But I know that Jesus lives in the chaos and that whatever we are going through today is nothing of the peace that is to come. But in those moments of chaos, it's so hard. I get it. I've been in the darkness. I know. It's so hard to trust. But that's exactly what God has called us to do. So the question is, Oh, I skipped one. Sorry, Blake. Before you go, you have to sow. Before you go, you have to sow. Before we can be disciples, before we can go out and make disciples, we have to invest in ourselves. And that's trusting the Lord when those moments of chaos happen. I've already covered that point. This is where I want to land. I want to land here. How do you sow your shalom? Where do you find your peace? Where does your peace come from? Wisdom? Folly? Does it come from Jesus? Does it come from the worldly things? Some of you might be saying, I read my Bible every day. That's where my peace comes from. It doesn't matter. It's good. Don't hear me. Hear hear what I'm saying. It's good, but it doesn't matter. Well, I pray every day. That's great. Doesn't matter. I'm a part of small groups. I give to the church. I do all these. I serve. That's great. Doesn't matter. None of that matters. Listen. None of that matters unless we're willing to surrender our lives to Jesus. None of it. This book, just another self-help book, if you're not willing to surrender your life to Jesus. Because if that is your foundation, then you can move forward and build your house. Jesus is our foundation. You can't build before you have the foundation. 
We stopped at Romans 5, 1 through 5. But if we go a little bit further, verse 8. But God, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. While we were still sinners. What? And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. But when Jesus went on that cross, and his body was broken to pieces. Those broken pieces are what restore our broken pieces. And this life will pick at you and pick at you and pick at you. And if we sit there and try to do it ourselves, we're gonna fail every single time. But if we remember that his body was broken for us, that's the start. Take the bread. Therefore, since we have been made right with God, in God's sight by faith we have peace Jesus went to the cross and his blood was spilled so that one day we could be restored so today we take the cup Would you bow your heads? Lord, there are so many things racing through my head right now. I'm asking that your spirit would be present. There is someone here today that has yet to surrender their life to you. And if we are looking for peace that only comes from you, it starts with surrendering to you. So with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you want to surrender your life to Christ, just go ahead and raise your hand so I can pray for you. One in the back, one back there, one over here. Father, there are some of us who we've been doing this religion thing a long time. We've been doing this following you for a long time. But we've yet to fully surrender ourselves to you. Or we have fallen away and we want to, we want to surrender to you again, Lord. If that's you today, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Oh yeah, hands in the back. Hands going up everywhere. Lord, for the hands that were raised, we surrender to you. We're calling upon your son as a community that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we are nothing without you. And we know that building a strong foundation so that we can go out to the world to, to show them about you starts with us and our surrender. When we are willing to surrender to you, that's when you move in. When things get crazy and chaos happens around us, that's when you move in. When we are in the depths of darkness, you move in. 
Why? Because you love us. You love us more than we could ever imagine. Thank you for all that you do, Lord. And I pray, I just pray, Lord, that this community would fully surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made a decision today or you're looking to talk to someone, fill out this card, put it in the offering box back there, or just talk to somebody. But this week, you go in peace, and then we come back next week and we talk about everything that God did. Go in peace. Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.